Wolf Pack, what is going on? It's your boy, the Wolf of Roto Street, RotoStreetJournal.com, where we breed and feed fantasy wolves. Here with your Week 15 Fantasy Football Semifinals Recap. If you're tuned in, that means you made it on to Week 16, unlike my fucking pathetic self. Awful. It's a very depressing doing one of these shows with nothing else on the line. Got absolutely battered, but here we are. For all of you that did make it in, comment in, let me know. I would love to live through you instead of my pathetic own self here. Uh, but we're going to, as always, go through your risers, your fallers, your waiver wire on Monday, who to look for if you're still in your finals, and then, of course, any injuries. And we got a couple big names on the injury report that we got to recap. And if you are in the championship, you got to know all of these important names, like Daniel Howland here. So fucking pumped to hear it. I will live vicariously through you. Uh, Enjoy your championship run. It's all about you guys at this point because I have nothing else to play for. Again, getting battered by Lamar, Chris Carson. Uh, You guys don't give a shit about my team, but over 180 points dropped on me. I would have beat anybody else out in the league. Sadly, everybody else was already accounted for. So Tough week for the Wolf, but you guys, thanks so much for tuning in. And I am here now, rest of the season, just to get you guys those titles. And if you're on the podcast, Fancy Full Back Dive, we paved your path to 2019 titles. Thanks for so much for listening. We really greatly appreciate it. Let's recap all of this action for you. I want to get to the risers, not the penny stocks, which you saw right there. Let's get it going. Julio Jones has to be amongst your biggest risers of the week. Holy hell, goes on a three-month drought of not scoring and then comes out with a whopping 20 targets, hauls in 13 of them for 134 yards, and not one but two scores. Anybody watching that game saw that one at the end there, especially if you had the under. Holy hell, puts you over if you bet the over. Uh, ruins your day if you had the under. And if you're facing Julio Jones in fantasy, yes, of course I was, uh, it also just smashed your hopes and dreams there. But what an absolute monstrous effort if you had him in. I know our guy Seamus, I don't know if you're tuned in, but he moved on to his finals for the fourth time since following Road Street Journal. Four years, four finals. Love you, Seamus. Congratulations if you're tuning in right now. Uh, And a big part of that was Julio Jones. What a monstrous effort. He threw the team on his back in a tough matchup against San Fran. There's two really big takeaways here. Of course, one, you never bench Julio Jones. I've got a lot of questions. Do I sit him this week? Tough matchup. He's been sucking. And I always have the same response. You never sit Julio Jones. So hopefully you listened. Uh, And if not, Sorry, but two, without Richard Sherman here, this San Fran D is exploitable, especially to number one receivers. We saw Julio go off this week. We saw Michael Thomas. So whether you play only in week 16, whether you have two weeks, San Fran's no longer a defense you have to avoid for number one receivers. So check them out at this point. Um, whoever they're facing, they got uh, Julio's coming up against Jacksonville. You're not benching him despite the U- A.J. Boy matchup. Uh, ultimately, the biggest riser of the week, though, by exploding on onto the scene with this type of effort. Where was it all year? The guy can obviously dominate. He hauled in, you know, well over 60% of Matt Ryan's yards on the day. A monstrous effort. Seamus, I see you finally made it to the broadcast. Congratulations. We're just raving about you making the finals four years in a row now since following the Roto Street Journal, and a big part of it was Julio Jones this week. Uh, glad to have you here. Derek Hale, so pumped to hear your win. You versus Steven, two Wolfpack members. Longer guy Steven there. I got to admit, probably pulling for my guy who's been there since day one. Uh, but Derek, I- I'm pumped to have you as a fan too. Appreciate you tuning in every week. And so it's a win-win for me. I hope both you guys... Have a great battle, epic wolf pack proportions that, that it deserves. Uh, glad to see you here today, though. And let me know, as, as always, guys, tune, tuned into the live audience. Any likes, comments, shares, especially shares, are greatly appreciated to help us get discovered. Uh, so thank you for that. Looks like we already got a bunch of them coming in. And, of course, get your questions in live so I can help you get ready for your championships. Next on the list, though, of big risers, if it wasn't Julio Jones exploding, it was Kenyon Drake not one, not two, not three, four touchdowns this week in addition to 137 yards. Holy hell. If you somehow started Kenyon Drake, and if you had him, you probably did. He's been the workhorse for the better part of two months now since getting traded to Arizona. So congratulations if you had him in there. Almost 40 fantasy points on the day for this guy. What an effort for Kenyon Drake. He had 10 career touchdowns entering this game. Nearly gets half of those in a single effort. What a dominant performance from him. Couple big reminders out of this one. One, the Cardinals lead back 
as long as Cliff Kingsbury is there, is going to be an RB1. We saw David Johnson putting up top five running back numbers each and every week for those first six weeks before getting hurt. Chase Edmonds then takes the throne and has a 33-point day before he goes down. And then Kenyon Drake right off the streets uh, and, and ultimately... He comes in with multiple RB1 efforts. There was a little bit of congestion, a little bit of, you know, ugliness for the last few weeks. David Johnson a little too involved, but they went back to their usual workhorse ways. Kenyon Drake dominating in that span. Uh, And again, the biggest scoring running back of Week 15. Congratulations if you started him. You're on your way to a title. Looking forward to 2020. I just raved about the system. Whoever is that lead back, whether it's back to David Johnson, and speculation is he's going to be gone, that they're going to be trying to move him. Please go to the Chiefs. What a perfect fit. They love it. And Andy Reid workhorse. They just haven't had one this year with pass-catching chops. Oh, God, David Johnson there. If he gets that explosion back, would be a beast. Kenyon Drake, a free agent. But you got to imagine he's really played himself into the Cardinals' plans moving forward. So keeper leagues, if he goes there, his value could never be higher. Uh, the, the the Cardinals would be the perfect landing spot for this guy. And if not, whether it's a rookie, whether Chase Edmonds, whoever it is, I will be taking in the first two rounds because this backfield system is that great. It doesn't even really matter the talent. And I love Kenyon Drake. He fits it like a glove. We've always said the guy just needs the opportunity, and he goes and shows why. Another guy who only needed volume, he's always had talent. Uh, It's been very apparent this year, even only as a rookie. That's A.J. Brown. What a title winner this absolute monster is. Hall's in 8 of 13 targets, his highest target total by 5 on the year. And what does he do with that? 114 yards and a score. His second straight week, over 25 fantasy points. And it couldn't have come at better times in your fantasy semis. Now your fantasy uh, your fantasy quarters, he has over 30. He is the number 2 wide receiver in fantasy over the last 4 weeks since week 12. Been absolutely dominating since Ryan Tannehill took over the wide receiver 10 in that span. I'm telling you now, I will be owning A.J. Brown in every single 2020 league. I don't care where the price is, whether it's fourth round, fifth round, even in the third round. This guy is a monster. He's a beast in terms of the catch point. He's even better after the catch, just steamrolling people. He looks like a fucking linebacker out there that can blaze a 4-340. It's like DK Metcalf that can actually run routes, uh, the better college teammate there. I absolutely love A.J. Brown as a player. I love him with Ryan Tannehill. Let's hope Ryan Tannehill ends up back with the Titans because those two have quite the bond here. Uh, But either way, this guy has been carrying you to ships right now. He gets the Saints this next week. And Lattimore has not been much of a shadow corner here. So ultimately, I love A.J. Brown. You have to obviously keep him in the lineups. Now, I have this confession of my sins. I faced A.J. Brown this week, and the only reason my opponent had him, I dropped him three weeks ago. What an absolute bonehead play. I deserve every inch that he gave me on Sunday. Brutal, painful, absolutely sucked taking it. We gotta, we need some help. We have a fantasy football glossary we're brewing. Anybody that has suggestions out there, what would be a term for someone that you cut and then somebody else picks them up and they just spank you around, get like a revenge game, that revenge game narrative. We want a term for that. So let us know what you think that should be. But AJ Brown, one of the best receivers of this week, one of the best receivers of the last four weeks and, and moving forward to 2020, I absolutely love that guy. Another guy, the common theme here is talent that finally got the volume it needed, finally deserved. That's Miles Sanders, a workhorsian effort that he lights up the scoreboard for. Uh, Was the actual highest scoring running back of the week here for the Eagles, lighting up the Redskins here uh, for a monstrous PPR effort. That catch, you you saw him just, uh, Carson Wentz rifled that one through, you know, how many defenders did he have to get that one through? Ridiculous throw, uh, even better catch by the guy to get his feet down. Ultimately, Miles Sanders, 19 rushes, 100 22 yards and a score plus six catches uh, for for yet another 50 yards and a second touchdown. So nearly 200 total yards, 24 touches. This is not what you expect from a Doug Peterson system, but maybe just maybe they've always been waiting for the right talent. Jordan Howard, a free agent after this year. His status is clearly crucial to monitor here on out because we just saw 
what Miles Sanders can do when he gets crazy volume. Uh, and man, is he an absolute monster. This line is beastly. The offense itself is beastly. And I love Miles Sanders' prospects longer term. Should he be able to finally lock down a featured role like this week in and week out? Uh, he gets a great matchup. You know, Dallas, mediocre middle of the road, but we saw Todd Gurley put up two scores against them. Sanders, especially assuming Howard is out, uh, would be a very, very high-end RB2, low-end RB1, moving forward you know, right around 70 80% of snaps. And Boston Scott's still involved, 13 touches, but that's just how much they fed Miles Sanders, and man, did he deserve it. Another wide receiver on this list, uh, and again, Elite talent finally getting the volume it deserves. Now, elite might be an overstatement, but this guy makes play after play. That's Terry McLaurin for the Redskins. Gets five targets and hauls in all of them, including, you know, ridiculous one-hander. 130 yards and a score in Week 15 versus the Eagles. Uh, starts it up early with a deep post, breaks the tackle, and gets in for a 75-yard score and had plenty of other nice chunk gains on the day there. Um, granted, you know, a couple of concerns. Steven Sims out-targeted him, doubled his share with 11 looks, whereas McLaurin only got five. He still doubled up the production, still scored. The guy's a monster, and it's great to see him producing with who's probably, at least for next year, their, their quarterback of uh, 2020. That's Dwayne Haskins, his OSU boy, even though they didn't have much of a rapport there. I keep seeing that report. It's like, yeah, they, they were on the same college team. McLaurin didn't do shit there because they had other guys playing above him. Regardless, uh, you got an upside guy. That's now going to be playing the Giants, the second most points to wide receivers. We saw Devontae Parker put up two scores. McLaurin has to be locked in the lineups moving forward. Um, and the, the common theme here is Julio was already locked in your lineups, but I wanted to pick guys that you may have been questioning going into your championship. Do I keep riding A.J. Brown? Do I keep riding Kenyon Drake? Uh, should McLaurin, was this a one-week mirage? No, I wanted to pick guys that you, you might have had an issue with, might have had a question with. These are all guys I would be locking into lineups this week. And last but not least, Jameis Winston. Setting an NFL record, no other quarterback in NFL history has ever thrown for back-to-back 450-yard days, and yet Winston, broken thumb, depleted weapons cabinet with Mike Evans hurt, and then Godwin leaving early, still goes career high, 458 yards, another four touchdown, of course throws an interception first drive of the game, I mean, it's Jameis Winston, that's how he kind of tees it off, gets the blood flowing, the juices going, is throwing some hideous fucking pick, you know Jameis Winston's going to do that stupid shit, but man, he's been masterful these last two weeks, making the decision for the Bucks very difficult this offseason, are they going to franchise him, do they make him a long-term extension, do they just let him go, you can't imagine they just let him go, at this point, uh, you know, steadying them right in the middle of the pack where they'll always be with Jameis Winston, yet too good to just let him go because quarterbacks are so hard to come by. It is that Bruce Arians just risk, no risk it, no biscuit style offense that we were thrilled about for Jameis Winston. Despite the slow start, he's really picked it up. I wish I had had more patience with the guy and kept him in my leagues because he has been a season winner uh, with the points he's been point- putting up. And the schedule has always been right. He gets another one against the Texans uh, primetime Saturday game, 1 o'clock this week. We should be seeing a firework show between him and Watson. I love targeting that game for DraftKings already, licking my chops to get my money in on that one. Uh, but Jameis Winston, whew, should be going for probably 400 more yards again next week in another cake matchup. What a beast. And that's even going to be without Godwin, even without Mike Evans. I think Winston's still going to be getting it done. So lock those guys into your lineups that I've been raving about. Uh, and there you go. Let's get to your questions before we move on to the followers. Again, this is supposed to be interactive, so get everything you have. Early sit starts, waiver wire questions, all your good stuff. Get it on in because at this point, the only thing I have to play for is you guys, you all. I love you, Wolfpack, and I want to bring you the titles that I, sadly, will be going without this season. Jeremiah Moore, you even destroyed Lamar. You beat Lamar this week, my dude? That's what I fucking love to hear. I was not over, able to overcome him because he also had Carson, Devontae, Parker. I, it was one of those weeks every single person on his team had over 20. I put up a nice 130. would have beat anybody else. Brutal. Uh, but if Chark plays him or Metcalf to go with Hopkins, I would probably just keep riding Metcalf. I don't remember Daniel off the top of my head who the Seahawks face next week. Is it the 49ers? Uh, let me know. But either way, I, I'd be a little nervous to go back to Chark. Uh, and they face... Who, who do they have? Uh... 
or Julio Jones Atlanta. So good matchup for Chark. So yeah, that's going to be a tricky one. Let me know. Remind me who Metcalf faces this week. I don't. I haven't looked at Week 16 yet. Uh, that's my ranking show tomorrow. And then we got Omar Foster, my man. Man, Drake put my Browns in a body bag yesterday. I need Michael Thomas to pull a hammy, getting off the team plane, and I'm in. By the way, McLaurin came through. Big, great call. My dude, I I always appreciate when people shout out the good ones because I love and I always hear about the bad ones. And I deserve it. I, I love taking them on. I Send your shit at me that I fucked up for you. But thank you, Omar. When I get them right... Doesn't hurt for a little ego boost like that. So I appreciate that. I'm glad it worked out. Uh, how many do you need to avoid from Mikey Thomas here? Because he's always a brutal pick. Uh, alrighty, what else we got? I'm down by ten. Still have M. Thomas going. Happy PR thing. I got, you gotta, you gotta be in a great chance, Giuseppe. Unless he gets hurt. I mean, he's put up ten half PPR every single game, right? Like that would be the by far outlier, the by far anomaly. If Mike Thomas doesn't get you uh, ten points, I would feel horrible for you. I think you should feel pretty good. Should I drop KCD for Indy for next week versus Carolina? KC versus Chai. I also have uh, Denver D who plays Detroit. A lot of good matchups for next week with you guys. I think you're kind of hoarding some of the best matchups. I like Indy there, honestly, with Will Greer. I mean, they got the weapons. If Greer blows up to have that be a risk, uh, I kind of like that move. I like what you're saying here, especially with Chai uh, Chicago playing a bit better. Denver could be good against a trip, but I don't trust them really. I think Indy's by far the highest upside there. I've had enough of the Haskins, McLaurin, Buckeye slander. Fucking McLaurin sucks, and you know it, CJ. Uh, what's up, Wolfpack? Jose Vega, great to see you. You got Breeze in your two QB league. I can send him because I already won. That's what I love to fucking hear, baby. Winston's been killing it. Omar Foster, uh, Omar Foster saying OJ Howard season. That's a great way to get this entire broadcast just puking and spitting venom at you. Uh, so let's hear it, Jeremiah. I know you're one of the first people to slap me in the face when I say OJ Howard's name with anything positive attached to it, but it's true. The guy is probably the last standing target there. We're going to talk about some waiver wire targets in the absence of all these wide receivers. Uh, Brashad Perriman obviously being the biggest name. Three fucking touchdowns. Holy hell, you can't write that shit. Uh, and also Justin Watson should be available in most leagues there. Uh, Derek Hale, can you trust Lindsay versus Detroit after the shitstorm? I was just going to say, I'm so pumped to hear you made it, Derek, because I know I recommended Lindsay seven fucking carries. Honestly, I, there's, I, I'm probably not t- trusting Lindsay. I get the matchups as juicy as can be, though. So like the, you've been trusting him week in and week out. He's been sucking a big one for you. And then you're going to bench him, and he's going to have two touchdowns. Like That's how it goes. I don't think you can bench Aaron Jones. I'd love to know all your potential options here, Derek, uh, because Aaron Jones, just even though the matchup's tough against Minnesota, he just gets so many goal line. You know, that volume within the red zone is so healthy. Flex, half PPR, Drake, Mixon, or James White. Uh, you got Miami coming up for Mixon, who's off of ripping up uh, the second highest total yards of his career last week. Uh, the, the highest was two weeks ago, and that was against a tough Patriots defense. What the fuck do you think he's going to do against Miami? You got to have Mixon in there as great as Drake was this last week. Uh, hopefully you can still get both both of them in, but Mixon would be far and away the top option for me, uh, Giuseppe. Derek Hale, if Panthers start, will Greer, do I still play DJ Moore? That's a big risk, my friend. Uh, he's been so damn good with shitty-ass quarterbacks that uh, can, will for, will, can Will Greer be worse? Probably not, but... It's still a question mark. I know how stacked your team is. I'd like to know your other options, but most likely, I I probably am still playing him. It depends on what the options are, though. Giuseppe, OBJ, Chark, or Pascal with Godwin Hurt, half PPR. Oh, God. Ah, man. Let's see what happens with Pascal and Hilton tonight with Hilton back. Does Pascal remain an option? I don't think I could ever trust OBJ, and now he's getting the Ravens, like... Uh, you shouldn't trust him anyways. You can't do it against the Cardinals. You're not going to do it against anybody. Uh, so probably DJ Chark, if he's playing, and we, we have a report on him, we're going to go over in a little bit. Let's get to Brickyard Prince. Keep the questions coming in, guys. I absolutely love it. You guys are giving me some restored faith in humanity. I was fucking... The day... Is there anything worse than going to work the day after a brutal fantasy loss and just having no leagues left and it's just like that empty, hollow feeling? Oh, God. Just painful. The fantasy depression really sinking in here. Why do I do this shit? I fucking hate it. And then I see you guys all, and it reminds me that I fucking love this shit. So let's keep it rolling, Wolfpack. Uh, 
Brickyard Prince, McLaurin over Galladay. I'm going to take that question. I'm going to hit the followers, and I'm going to get right back to everything you guys are asking. Uh, so keep it coming, guys. You guys are giving me life today. I, I got to go McLaurin there. I mean, one, you got the blow up, the 130 and a TD this week. Finally showing a rapport with that shit-ass bum at quarterback, uh, <laughs> Dwayne Haskins. But two, and we're going to get to fo- followers because Galladay is on the list. Let's get there now. Uh, you see there at the bottom, Kenny Galladay. Pathetic day. 44 yards despite facing the worst of defenses in the league uh, in terms of Tampa Bay. Nobody's more generous. He still only puts up 44 yards because David Blow blows. He's horrible. Uh, and now he's going to get Detroit, uh, Detroit's getting Denver with Chris Harris, one of the top lockdown corners. I mean, Blau is going to chuck some horrendous bombs up to Galladay. We saw Tyree Kill get behind Harris a couple times. It's not like he's impenetrable, but I don't trust Blau to be the type of guy to take advantage of that. He's going to see the double coverage and probably shy away. Um, and so we got another question, Giuseppe, asking about Edelman. He's on our followers list, so let's get to it. Uh, just like I did with my risers, I want to prioritize guys that are having a lot of sit-start questions already entering the week. Same idea here. Like, do I even have to keep these guys? Do I sit? Do I play them? Uh, I wanted to t- touch upon some guys who had shitty ass performances that are, are lineup fixtures a lot of the weeks. Um, DD Westbrook at the top list, not a lineup fixture, but someone we have to discuss now. Uh, so we're going to get to some guys that at this point, if their name's on this list, I'm benching in week 16 already. Uh, one of them is D.D. Westbrook. A lot of people expecting a huge uptick in work, uptick in production with DJ Chark out. And I thought, so, you know, I, I had him, you know, my top 30, like right around 29, I'd say, wide receivers this week. So I was buying into it. Uh, the guy's great after the catch. He had the Oakland matchup, but doesn't get it against one of the worst secondaries in the league. Two catches, 14 yards on just only four fucking targets. This is probably the most concerning part of that stat line. Gets a little bit of yardage on his fucking lone rush attempt. But either way, a sickening, disturbing line. If you were looking for a streamer, you went to Westbrook. He sucked as hard as anybody can. Uh, and at this point, just cut the guy. There's no point in ever rolling him out. I get the Atlanta matchup is tasty, but DJ Chark expected back. Uh, and if he can't get it done as the, the clear number one with a lot of volume there, Chris Conley ended up being the preferred option. No need to at all go to D.D. Westbrook. After him, another option that's making me real nervous here. That's Austin Hooper. Ever since returning, just been a complete bag of dirt. Three catches on six targets, 20 yards, nothing. No Calvin Ridley, didn't matter. It all went to Julio Jones. That was the play. That was the uh, where the entire market share went. And it doesn't really matter at this point at tight end. Like You can't get... Austin Hooper in your lineup, despite how pathetic the position is, you obviously are going Tyler Higby, or you know, I guess it depends on your options because at the end of the day, there are only so many options at tight end. But Hooper is a guy that is getting a ton of, you know, do I play this guy? I'd rather have Rudolph in my lineup because if we're gonna be touchdown dependent, at least score fucking touchdowns, dude. Uh, so pathetic, you know, not a great matchup against Jacksonville coming up. He still is playing in Dirk Cutter's tight end dreamboat scheme. I still think a big game could happen with Calvin Ridley out, but to me it's the Julio Jones show, and I can't really trust much else about that pass attack. Now this one, getting to you, Giuseppe, should I be worried about Edelman? It looks like a few other people like him that having the same type of question. My answer is yes. I think you absolutely need to be. He has two catches, five targets for only nine yards. The bigger concern, though, is, is this guy fully healthy? Tons of pregame reports. The knee is dinged up. Uh, You know, a lot of ailments right now for Julian Edelman. And he just didn't look like himself. He's also got the shoulder issue going on. It wasn't his physical, usual self. Wasn't smooth and out of his breaks. And, you know, a lot of balls, just miscommunication between him and Brady. He seemed checked out completely. If there was ever a week to just rest the guy and let him get fully healthy, why not against the fucking Bengals, by all means? Come on, dudes. Uh, So that sucked. And now coming in is Tredavious White and this Bills defense that has been locked down against wide receivers all year. If Edelman's not going to do it against the... The, the Bengals, who have been pretty generous to slot receivers I mean, just a few weeks ago, Cooper Cup had 220 yards out of the slot against these guys, then what's going to happen here? And a lot of his struggles, it, you know, one is Edelman's own health concerns, but then two, you know surrounding talent is one of our huge factors in our fantasy stock formula. I dare I say it, do I slander the GOAT, the greatest, the my love of my life, Tom Brady? 
<laughs> he's been crap this year. It's 128 yards and a pair of touchdowns with almost under 50% completion percentage against a bad Bengals defense. It was as ugly as can be. Brady did not look good. He was not on the same page as any of his receivers, including Edelman. I am worried about Edelman. I certainly am worried about Tom Brady in fantasy, at least. I would not have either of those guys in my lineups. And I mean, Edelman's tough to bench because he's been so lights out all year. But in a tough matchup against the Bills at less than full health and with Brady struggling right now, I don't know that I could have Edelman in my lineups, Giuseppe. I'd like to know who else you have. I know your team's pretty stacked. Uh, he's going to probably be bottom 25 or so for me coming into this week. We'll see how he ends up doing. Another guy following this one I, got, I put on specifically for you, Derek Hale. I knew you'd be tuned in. That's Philip Lindsay. A league that gets half uh, points per carry. You didn't even benefit from that because he only gets seven fucking totes for 32 yards, and that's the risk. It reminds us one very game flow dependent. If they get down early, the Broncos, they're going to be in some trouble. Now, granted, they get the Detroit Lions. You don't go down against the Detroit Lions because they have David Blows at quarterback. Still, though, reminder of how game flow dependent Lindsey is. Uh, did not get it done against a pathetic second most points to running backs. Uh, Chiefs team, I get the weather, was concerning, but that often favors running backs, and it did not hear only 32 pathetic yards, didn't catch either of his two targets. Just a horrendous day. And, you know, if I have even a mediocre option, despite that juicy matchup, I, I would have a real hard time trusting Philip Lindsay. We already got a question. We already kind of covered this. But Kenny Galladay sees seven targets, hauls only three of them in for 44 yards, despite facing the worst defense in the league to wide receivers. Absolutely pathetic. Yes, he goes over 1,000 yards, becomes the second line to ever do that. Congratulations, Jay. He reached that milestone. Everything else was absolutely abysmal and pathetic. And now he gets the Chris Harris-led Broncos, who outside of this week against Tyree Kill, Harris has been as locked down as can be. So ultimately, you got to be concerned about Galladay. Uh, he has, you know, had that huge Thanksgiving 104 TD. He can get it done because Blau does just chuck. But overall, uh, it has not been good at all. For David Blau, uh, with David Blau at the helm, as expected too. So I would most likely be sending uh, Kenny Galladay to my bench. And last but not least, and this is, I I'm sorry, Omar, if you're still tuned in. I know these are your boys. I know we have a lot of Broncos fans. Michael Shear, a bunch of you guys. I mean, not Broncos, Browns. What the fuck is up with your team? Has there been ever a bigger disappointment in the NFL than the fucking Browns this year? The best, most hyped on paper team of all time, the Super Bowl MVPs on paper, is an absolute and utter cluster fucking disaster of an offense, of a team. And it all starts with a coach. Freddie fucking Kittens is a pathetic loser. Cannot command a locker room for the hell of him. Uh, but just dumb in games. Not nearly the, the creative play caller with everything else on his plate that we saw last year that we were excited about. And I gotta, I'll take the L. I was all about Baker Mayfield with the new weapons cabinet, with the head coach he had thrived with, with Todd Air Raid Munkin coming in. Pathetic. Odell Beckham didn't do anything for his value. Jarvis Landry is having a decent year, but still, the man at the center of it all, Baker fucking Mayfield. What an abysmal season. Our two, number two quarterback ranked in the season. Oh, God. 30 of 43 passes, 247, two scores, and an interception for a meager 13 points against the most generous team in the league to quarterbacks. Humongous L for the Wolf, for Roto Street on that one. Pathetic call, folks. And just the Browns in general. Uh, <laughs> giving up 38 points to a Cardinals team that had been averaging 20 per game, only scoring 13 against a defense that had been giving up over 28 per game. Just... All around, a joke effort from a joke team, from a joke franchise. Until they get an actual adult in there at, at coach, then I am severely worried for your franchise. There are teams in worse shape. They got a quarterback that should somehow rebound, but man, he's got to get his fat ass in fucking shape and actually care about the game. You can just tell he didn't do any shit this entire offseason. The fat loser face Baker Mayfield. It makes me sick how bad this motherfucker was. Odell Beckham whining. Uh, these reports just fucking make me just gag. Odell Beckham isn't planning to request a trade this offseason. No fucking shit, you whiny little diva. Like, it, you go to work like every other fucking human, except you make millions of dollars to play a fucking sport. 
court. And now he's not going to request a trade. He's actually going to keep his mouth fucking shut for once. It just blows my mind that that's a report. He's not going to request a trade. Should we just all throw some fucking roses at Odell's feet? Ooh, you de- like, ugh, just disgust me. And then Jarvis Landry on the sideline, yeah, apparently yelling, come get me to the other team. Just so unfucking professional. Such a joke. And that's what happens to joke franchises with joke coaches. They have joke ass players become even bigger jokes like that. Uh, so fuck the Browns. I'm sorry, all my Browns fans. You, you can hate me. You can send some venom my way. But that is a just everything about that loss is an exclamation point on your crap fucking season in terms of fantasy, in terms of real life. Pathetic. And there ends my Browns rant. You better get the fucking rid of Freddie Kitchens. Let's get back to your questions, folks. <laughs> Dylan Adams. Uh, I had the perfect lineup and got beat by 20. He had Saquon and Miles Sanders that both DP'd me. Holy shit. Playing for third now. I'm not amused. Dylan Adams, I feel that pain. Uh, it's the same deal for me. I would have beat any other team. Uh, I faced Lamar. I faced Carson. I faced Devontae Parker. He did not have a single player score under 20 points. It was just, you know, nothing I could done. I didn't really make any mistakes other than, you know, not getting a higher seed and having to run into that absolute buzzsaw. It was brutal, Dylan. I apologize. It just Sometimes that's just what happens. And it's not like it. you'd think it would feel better when you had a good team that just, you know, y- you couldn't have done anything. And it doesn't. It still sucks. You still go to work and want to throw up and want to punch everything that you see walking by. And, and you know, maybe a few more holes in the walls later tonight. We'll find out. Derek Hale played Singletary this week against New England. Did well against Pitt. And he did well against Baltimore. The guy is becoming very quickly matchup proof. If I had a seven spot on my risers, Derek Hale, it would have been Devin Singletary. He's now been over 70% of the snaps in three straight games. Uh, so one, again, talent getting volume. Devin Singletary is getting that volume. We saw Mixon run all over this Patriots team. They have been soft up the middle. I do like Devin Singletary this week, and I did not like him coming into the game against Pittsburgh. I was down on the guy, but now that he is so locked in, again, three straight weeks, 70% of the snaps, over 20 touches in those times, man, and over you know 15 points in all those games, I absolutely think he can get there against New England this week. Indy D or Seattle D next week? Uh, I don't know who Seattle faces. We already talked about uh, Indy has that juicy matchup coming up against Will Greer. I'm sure he's going to turn it over at least three times. So I like Indy. I got to know uh, Seattle faces, is it is it the Rams? Uh, remind me who they face. Daniel Howland. Metcalf versus Arizona. Chark versus Falcons. I got to, oh, it's Arizona for Seattle. Okay. So I'm going to go Indy D there, Giuseppe. We just saw Arizona kind of turn it on. Uh, we got... Metcalf versus Arizona. I got to go Metcalf there. I mean, yeah, Patrick Peterson might shadow him, but he hasn't even been good in the shadow role there. Uh, And he's just getting it done. He's such a beast. I love Metcalf there. He's 26 from Thomas and Lutz, full PPR. So I'm pretty much toast. Should have played McLaurin that league too instead of Galladay, hoping he slips on a banana peel in the tunnel. (laughs) I'll toss one out there for you. Uh, Ultimately, Giuseppe, yeah, just pathetic stuff. Omar, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, like, you know, the, the Mario Kart, wee, 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 just, just t- twist the ankle. But you never know. I mean, if the touchdowns go elsewhere and it's just a bunch of touchdowns and Lutz only gets five, it's totally within the realm of possibility. I would not give up hope yet, Omar. I don't want to give you false hope. I'd set your odds at like 30% win, 70% loss, but it's, it's, and it's full PPR. That doesn't help either. Uh, best of luck, my dude. You've been a loyal, loyal Wolfpack member all year, so I really hope it happens for you. Uh, Giuseppe, OBJ, DJ Moore, half PPR. It's not OBJ, so DJ Moore, despite the ship on at QB, uh, it's what I got to go with most likely. Let's see what Pascal does tonight, though, how him and T.Y. Hilton coexist. Giuseppe Russo, have Jameis. Should I drop Kyler for Indy D in my other league uh, or hold on to him? I guess that depends on your opponent, right? Is your opponent going to pick up Kyler and then potentially start him? Uh, is Indy D more valuable? Like You don't want to give your opponent a weapon just to pick someone up. So I would check that first. Now, if you know no one's going to play Kyler against you, then maybe, yeah, because you don't need him if you're going to roll Jameis no matter what. And at this point, how do you sit Jameis? Uh, but if your opponent could even have a, the iota of using Kyler, then I would not do it. Up 56, and they have Breeze and Kamara tonight. Do I get in the finals? Ben, my dude, 
I'd love to say your ticket's already punched. You never know what happens. I was up 56 one year against Pierre Thomas and a kicker, and I fucking lost on Monday Night Football in a championship. So you never fucking know what's going to happen, but I do really like your chances. Just because, too, I guess Kamara of all running backs is a little bit more of a receiver. But if Kamara goes off with like three rushing scores, at least you know Breeze isn't getting those two. It would be deadly if they connect on like two receiving scores. Then you're in some fucking trouble. But ultimately, I feel really, really good about your spot. I'd say like 90%, 10% uh, you've gotten in. If I sit Lindsay, who do I flex between DJ Moore? Uh, I have Adams and Thomas, Singletary, Monty, or James White. I would go. I would. I would sit absolutely Lindsay for Singletary at this point. You're not putting in Monty. Fuck him. Uh, and then James White. You don't get that half per carry. So I like Singletary a lot. Seems like they would use Lindsay similar to how the Pats use James White when they get down instead of shitty Royce. Freeman. I agree, Omar. Like, I, I, Lindsay's not quite the pass protector. Freeman is better in protection, but Lindsay's so elusive in space. Why are they not more creative with this guy at all? Honestly, do I play Kamara or Murray? Says Jeffrey. You got to go with Kamara, right? Like, you have to. It's it's Alvin Kamara. It's your first-round pick. Your top three, probably, overall pick. You just got to go with your guy there. I have Hooper, Ingram, and Waller. Should I drop one for Perriman? And who would you drop of out of the three? I would drop Ingram at this point. Uh, I guess I want to know his status. Does your opponent need a tight end? Are you going to use Perriman? Because Hooper could probably be dropped too because he's been a real shithead. Uh, I guess I'd be more scared to face Ingram. Is your opponent going to use either of those tight ends, I guess, is the question. Giuseppe. Uh, I faced Carson, Saquon, Kelsey, Shepard in the same line. Brutal, man. I faced all the. I faced Kelsey too. Like you, you're, you're, Me and you were staring down the gun. And Lamar Jackson was there. Uh, they all just had a fucking field day with my ass. It sucks. It absolutely sucks. But let's get to waiver wise. So we got a question on Perriman, and he leads off. The uh, waiver wire here, your waiver wire check brought to you by RotorStreetJournal.com where we breed and feed fantasy wolves. And if you like our content, the cleanest way to consume it is on our app. Search the app store, Roto Street Journal in your app, RSJ even in your apps on Apple only right now. We would love to get to Android. And later this week, uh, I will be putting up what we call the tip jar. First time ever I'm even asking for a cent. We love to give you knowledge. We want our best content to always stay free. Uh, but we do want to also take RSJ to the next level this off season. So keep your eyes and ears peeled if, you, if we've helped you at all over these last three years. Again, we haven't asked for a single dime and, and we're not going to go out there too often begging for money or anything like that but we ultimately want to bring our content and our outreach to the next levels and so if we've helped you at all uh, you know we'll be sending that out later this week and it would mean the world to us if we've helped you at all uh, especially around this Christmas time you want to give a little to the the wolf for us to again upgrade our product upgrade our outreach we're not taking a dime of it all to keep for ourselves it's all about going into the business now so uh, we'll greatly appreciate your help enough plugging me though let's get to the waiver wires where you will find some action still out there in week six which is crazy finals week that you'll find something actually usable on the waiver wire and there's a lot actually we kick it off though with Brashad Perriman by far the top option this week if you have any dollars left throw them all on this guy 11% owned so good chance he's out there for you and look at what he fucking did five of six targets hauls him in for 113 and three touchdowns insanity for uh Brashad Perriman there a monstrous effort. He would be starting in a ton of my lineups at this point because Godwin's now out. We know Evans is out. He's the de facto number one in offense that chucks and chucks and chucks and chucks some more. Uh, so Brashad Perriman, yes, the matchup was great against Detroit, but guess what? The matchup's going to be great again against Houston, who's given up top seven in terms of points. Two wide receivers. Expect this guy to be having a field day against the tennis, uh, the the Houston Texans this week. I absolutely love Brashad Perriman, um, in borderline top 15 wide receiver with all these other wide receivers out with the matchup as juicy as it is. Give me Brashad Perriman all day. If he is gone or you, you need more than just one receiver, Anthony Miller would be easily the next spot I look. He's been more consistent and probably a higher floor than Brashad Perriman and comes off his best game of the year. Nine catches on 15, 15, 15. 
15 motherfucking targets. Holy hell. For 118 yards and a score. That usage alone, just 15 targets. I don't even have to tell you what he did with them. Should have had you all horned up and ready to go. Uh, but still, the fact that he dominated on those and has been dominant for the better pa- part of this last month tells you uh, that, that this guy has to be in your waiver owner plans. He's only 26% owned. He's put up 11, 18, 12, and 22 across his last four games. He's been a top 15 wide receiver in that span. Trubisky seems to have finally found a pulse, finally has a mediocre at best arm, but still the guy's getting it done. So Anthony Miller with a matchup uh, coming up against the Chiefs. They're, they're decent against the pass this year, shockingly. Made some really big upgrades to that that defense, but as long as Taylor Gabriel has been out, Miller has been feasting on volume, and the guy should probably be your wide receiver three this week. Uh, at least own him and not let your opponent have him potentially go off against you. And that, the only running back on this list, because there really isn't a whole lot out there, Dalvin Cook injury. Now, we're going to cover that in a little bit. Not as serious as originally you know, concerns suggested, but if he does miss it, Mike Boone seems like the immediate handcuff. Now, Madison could also be out there. A lot of drops this week after he's going to miss the game. I would still would stash him, too, because if he's healthy, uh, Madison would probably be the de facto number one. But Mike Boone, a preseason darling, very explosive guy, gets 13 carries in the absence of Dalvin Cook for 56 yards, so over four yards a pop. Pops in two touchdowns on the day. A lot of Cook owners cringing because they know those two would have gone to them. Uh, and now he's getting the Packers, the top five matchup, uh, fifth most points to running backs here on the season. If he were the guy, let's say Madison and Cook sit, Mike Boone would easily be top 12 in my running back rankings this week. And that's just, you know, just because, one, the zone blocking scheme, so valuable to the matchup, pure juice. Three, Mike Boone definitely has a little juice in those legs too. Uh, so I love Mike Boone. He's got to be one of your waiver priorities. At minimum, if you own Dalvin Cook and you're still in it, you got to spend everything you have because it's a Monday night game and you have to have this backup plan ready uh, for your, your absolute horse. Another wide receiver starting to thrive quietly, very, very quietly set a career high in yardage this this season. Old man Danny Amendola, for as much as he's done in his career, this has been somehow the best year of his uh, his, his career. And that doesn't include postseason, obviously, where Danny just becomes playoff Danny. But still, hauls in eight of his 13 targets. 13 targets, yeah. I mean, we can pause again, just like Anthony Miller, 15. 13 for Danny Amendola. Gets 102 yards on them. Just barely misses a touchdown, too, to make the day even more juicy. So that's a guy, yes, he feasted on that matchup uh, against the worst defense in the league. He kind of did what everyone might have thought Kenny Galladay would do. But he gets Denver. You imagine Harris goes and follows Galladay. It's not where I would be. It's not a matchup I'm dying to get Amendola in my lineup. But he has shown that nice rapport. This is the first game without Aaron, uh, Marvin Jones rather there. And Danny Amendola is the one that kind of steps up and takes the, the team lead and targets and yardage. Worth a look if you're desperate. And if he's not out there because he's 25% owned and you missed on Miller and you missed on Brashad Perriman and you're still desperate for wide receiver, well, guess what? 0% owned right now. Greg Ward for the Eagles. He was the only wide receiver to register a single catch in this game. It was the tight end show, and it was Greg Ward. And he lit it up for the wide receiver part of it. Seven catches on nine targets, 61 yards, and the score uh, going up and over people, making high degree difficulty of catches, chemistry style throws, you know, over the back shoulder, things that you just don't see in a wide receiver in his first real start. But he was clearly the only guy Carson Wentz trusted. And that's huge coming here down the stretch now. Get the Cowboys, not the most ideal of matchups, but not completely shut down either. If you need a wide receiver, and again, I look at Perriman, Miller, and Amendola in that order first. But if you miss out on all of them, Greg Ward, another potential option. And last but not least, if you're desperate at tight end, let's say Ian Thomas is really fucking you, and, and you know Greg Olson's coming back, Jonu Smith. Back-to-back, over 10-point days, this time getting 14, hauling in five balls for 60 yards, and then a 57-yard rush, uh, and almost gets in there on a a goal line play as well. So ultimately, the guy, you know, touchdown the week before, has been thriving. He'll probably be within my top 10 tight ends 
this next week. Uh, it's always a risk, but he's such an athletic specimen. And you got Ryan Tannehill really balling out. So I like Jonu Smith this week. Uh, definitely a guy I would look at. Chris Conley, another one. Two touchdowns, only 20% owned. And Boston Scott at running back, another 13 touch day. And if they get down against the Cowboys in this battle for the division, Boston Scott should yet again see 14 to 15 touches. And he's real explosive with all the work he's getting. Now on to any questions we have, and then we'll cover the injuries to wrap this all up. Uh, Benny Tom's Extreme Fitzmagic, AJ Brown, Slayton Laird, McLaurin, and Chicago D to punch your ticket. What a fucking all-star street team. I love the description. Grittier. Just pure, absolute grit out of you, Ben. That is awesome. I fuck, You earned it. You punched that ticket to absolute perfection. Uh, again, just you know, look at the names there. Laird and Slayton. I mean, A.J. Brown, just pure juice, too. You you got it done. That's And those type of fantasy wins. I've had them, too. The last title I won was a bunch of waiver wire goons. When you win with the goons, there's nothing better. Uh, it's just even that much more satisfying. So congratulations, Ben. Uh, well done. And, and Definitely well done. I came in midseason. Do you do any pre-draft shows before the season, Daniel? Absolutely. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to plug some of our stuff. But all summer, starting in you know August, we're gonna we do what's called the Daily Draft Wizard, where I pull up um, you know the fantasy football. Uh, fantasy, what is it? Fantasy pros. They do the the draft wizard, and I'll get your settings, your scoring. I do customized live drafts uh, in this type of mindset. We're gonna hopefully though. The goal is to really update all our equipment. You guys know sometimes these broadcasts lag. Uh, I can have a higher quality camera, all that stuff. Our main goal is just really make it so our our broadcasts are perfect, and that we have a, a consistent three to four shows a day in the summer. Because I'm a teacher, Daniel, and that's when I have my time off, and I go all in on our RSJ in the summers. I used to work at a, a restaurant now, and now is that that's, I use that time. I only got a couple years left where I could truly go all in. So I go all in on my summers, and we're going to hopefully have a, a great show schedule every single day, broadcasting the podcast, broadcasting our Fantasy Wolves segments. We had some great interviews with like Scott Barrett of Pro Football Focus, and we have Grant Barfield of NFL.com, Mike Wright of the Fantasy Footballers, Adam freaking Schefter last summer. So, I mean, we had a loaded summer last summer. We made some great predictions. We obviously missed a few, too. Uh, but Daniel, yes, we will be absolutely be doing pre-draft. That's where we, I, I think, is honestly, I, I love our in-season coverage, but I think our pre-draft, when I have all the free time in the world, uh, is even better. So yes, Daniel, thanks for letting me get that quick plug-in. Uh, and we hope to have you here all summer, Wolf, back. Would you pick up Boone or Madison? That's a great question, Giuseppe. Honestly, I... I really think Madison's the guy. We got to try to see between now and tomorrow is there any reports on that ankle if he's going to make it. CJ does not agree that Perriman should be top 15, but riddle me this, CJ. Who the fuck else are they going to throw to in a juicy matchup against the Texans with no Godwin, no Evans? I mean, I mean, Jameis is back to back 450. You know he's chucking for 303 at least. You got to think Perriman's getting at least 70 in a TD of that. Uh, I would probably. I haven't done the rankings yet, so I have no clue where he's going to end up. But my guess is top 15. Yes. Would you play Perriman over Edelman next week? Yes, I would, Giuseppe. Absolutely. Do you do pre-draft shows before the season? I think I just answered that one, Daniel. But yes, we absolutely do. Uh, roll with Waller versus Chargers, or put Hollister in since he faces Arizona. You always, always, always. If you got the option to face Arizona, you have to go with it. Uh, Waller is off such a great day, Derek Hale, that that's tricky. Uh, you know, he had like, what, 86 yards in the first quarter alone. But, oh, man, that matchup, that, that's going to be a hard one. I have to come back to you on that one. I have to you know do a little more research on how the Chargers are against tight ends. Uh, but my gut right now is, ugh, Hollis has been such a fucking bum, though. That's really tough. My gut right now says Waller. Uh, would you pick up Boone and drop Jamal Williams? Yes, David, I would. Like, no one's using Jamal Williams next week unless you have you know multiple weeks. And you got to see if Aaron Jones goes down. But at this point, he was kind of just a, a handcuff with a little bit of benefits. You're not going to put him in your lineup. I don't imagine Jamal Williams. You might as well go for the hail mary and get Boone. So yes, I would do that, David. Alrighty, and let's cover the injuries. And the only reason I wouldn't go all all in to get Boone is at the top of our injury board, Dalvin Cook. Now it exited with a shoulder injury, the same shoulder, and it looked brutal. He crumbled. He was getting helped off the field, screaming, hugging the body. Just looked like it was just very significant and brutal pain there. 
But already today, Mike Zimmer comes out and says, yeah, it feels good today. When they asked him he's going to play through, Zimmer continued, I think he, you know, there wasn't any issue with him. There were probably a couple of times we could have gotten the ball to him more. So if he could have gone back in already, if he was asking for the ball more, my guess is Dalvin Cook is going to be fine to go. Uh, if not, and again, this matchup's coming against the Packers, giving up the fifth most points to running back. If it's again just a matter of pain tolerance, he's been playing through pain all year. I expect him to uh, to saddle it up and go. It's a great divisional battle here with a lot on the line. Uh, if not, though, that's where Boone or maybe Madison, if he's healthy, would just be monstrous plays. But to me, it seems like Cook, if, if he had to read the tea leaves and what they suggest, it seems to me like he will be out there this week. The big injury that we know the guy is not returning, that's Chris Godwin. Now let's, you know, put our hands up and send it to the, the ceiling. Mr. Godwin, you were the best fourth-round pick I think I've ever had. Thank you for delivering on every bit of hype you got and then way more than anyone could have ever expected. Uh, and and that includes that. We were as high as could be. We saw you dominating the preseason. We saw the target share. Uh, we knew the talent's always been there in the red zone. We knew you were going to be playing two wide receiver sets and then kicking into the slot. And you just, again, Bruce Arians was a perfect coach for you after you. he's done such great work with the slot receivers but he gets a hamstring injury that, according to Bruce Arians, does not look good. He's not expected to be out there for Week 16, probably done for the season at this point. When they have nothing left to play for, uh, it seems to me like with now Evan shelved, Scotty Miller also left with a hamstring injury. It's back to Brashad Perriman, Justin Watson, and O.J. Howard here, folks. Uh, Perriman being my favorite option. Watson, much more available and an athletic freak. We'll draw secondary coverage, so maybe he's the one that blows up. And then you also got O.J. Howard uh, as a potential streamer at tight end as well. It's a great matchup for all three against a Houston team that's bottom 10 against all those positions and running back too. Uh, maybe Duke Johnson. I don't know. I guess that has nothing to do with it. But maybe the running game. <coughs> Rojo gets a little more involved here against a Houston team that's very generous to running backs too. But ultimately, I love Paraman. Uh, Watson will be top 35 or so for me. And then O.J. Howard will be a top 10 tight end play with all the walking wounded here in Tampa Bay. Last two to cover. Greg Olson has cleared concussion protocol. He did not play this week, but is expected back out there. Will Greer is the QB. Maybe they decide let's just go full rebuild mode. Let's see what Ian Thomas has. Um, and, And they avoid... Uh, really peppering Olsen here. Maybe they don't even put him in. But just in case you were still streaming Thomas after his shit fucking awful ass, why the hell did I ever trust you motherfucking awful loser Ian Thomas? I want to fucking slap you in the face. Ugh. You shouldn't be using either of these guys. Case in point. Let's let's shut up there. And last but not least, DJ Chark. Well, good, good, good menu management there. DJ Chark, uh, last but not least, is cleared to get on the field and do some running and cutting on Monday. If he's out there, you got that matchup against the Falcons. The guy's been a top 10 wide receiver all year. He plays better with Minshew, despite that one monstrous game with Foles. The rest of the year was with Minshew, and he showed a great rapport all year. Uh, ultimately... D.D. Westbrook obviously gets kicked to the curb. If Chark's there, he was kind of shitty as we covered in the followers anyways. Conley maybe gets a bigger roll after a 49-yard 2-TD day. But if active, D.J. Chark would be a top 25 play, maybe even top 20, as again, he's been a top 10 wide receiver all season and now gets another juicy matchup to wrap up your year. Alrighty, let's get back to the rest of your questions. We got Mateo. I'm up by 10.8 versus Saints D. That's my guy, motherfucker. I'm so happy to hear you're in a good spot. Now, the Saints D at the Dome uh, against Indy would definitely, you know, could they get to 10? Yes, so don't count your chickens before they roost, my friend. But I feel good for you. I hope you make it because you've are you been an awesome fan all season. And your, and your kind words here mean the world. I wouldn't be competing this week if it wasn't for your, your recommendation. I'm happy to hear it, my man. I only hear about the bad calls usually, not the good ones. So I'm so pumped to hear that. Let me know what you guys think of this idea. I have this one. Oh, hi. Uh, But I had an idea that if we could get live call-ins where you guys, you know, it's like a radio show essentially, 
what about like a one hour de- or 20 minutes, whatever it was, dedicated to you guys just bitching? Whether it's a bad call by me, whether it's to a specific player, like Ian Thomas, for example. If I wanted to call in and say, thank you, Ian Thomas, for being a complete and utter fucking asshole and ruining my week. And we call it in the wine line, right? We have live call-ins. We play some sad music for you. Edit it up real nice after the fact. And maybe we even after that, you, you get your chance to bitch at me. You confess my sins and all that good stuff. We have a, a little nice gay get together where we just love each other and talk about all the good calls because that's the stuff. It, it, I truly do this to help you guys. Um, and I, I, you know, no, none of us can ever bat a hundred. So when I get them right, it really, it, I, I love it for you guys. Uh, and at this point, you guys are all I got to play left for because I'm certainly not right. Uh, let's. You chose Monty over Godwin, and then denied trade offer to get him at Monty at the beginning of the season. Ah, uh, man, that's tough because <laughs> Godwin was an absolute. Awesome, awesome uh, player. Thanks. Have a great night. Roll everyone besides Breeze and Kamara. Best of luck, Benny. I hope you get it done. Look forward to hopefully seeing you tomorrow. I have to work a basketball game, so I don't know what time the broadcast will be. I'll keep you all posted. Uh, I'm hoping to squeeze it in before the game, though. Um, and then, yeah, I'm glad you like my, my ideas, CJ. Uh, Conley, Edelman, or Perriman, half PPR. Um, I'm going to go Paramin as my favorite option there, Giuseppe. But again, I got to get to the rankings and, and really see it. All righty, folks. Great. You know, last, uh, maybe I'll do one on next Monday, even though none of us will be playing. Maybe we'll do a little 2020 look ahead, whatever it is you guys want. Let me know. Because uh, again, I love this shit. I'll be doing it all off season. So whatever content's helpful for you guys, whatever you enjoy the most, uh, come back, let me know. And I will be happy to cover it all. Giuseppe, I would do Pittsburgh D as my favorite option. Uh, I don't even know who they're facing, but they're they're great defense. Duck Hall just left them out to dry last week. And Indy D probably over Denver D there uh, for that one. Uh, you have a great night too, my man. And thanks so much for a wonderful season, especially guys like Giuseppe, uh, you know, all the guys that just came out every week, Mateo, Derek, Steven, you know, for three years, all you guys, the Wolf Pack uh, in, in the podcast. We know you got Link Clegg. We know we got all the regular fans messaging us in um, and some great new fans like Daniel midseason. You guys all just made this season so great. Omar, Jose, all you guys that come every single week. I know Austin, I don't know where you are today, but uh, so many of you guys made this season so much fun, so special to uh, share with y'all. So I'm so excited to, uh, to wrap it up with a few more shows and we'll be crushing it all off season for you guys. So thanks so much for your time, for your support. It means the world, guys. Alrighty, have a great night.